Hello, hello, hello. This is Dragasa, and welcome again to Straight Talk About Business. Today, I'm absolutely delightful to have as my guest, Jeff Marlowe. So really, who is Jeff Marlowe? Well, for more than 35 years, Jeff has been helping organizations throughout Europe, Asia, and the U.S. tackle important strategic issues in focused and pragmatic ways. I support his beliefs that the way we've always run organizations has run out of time. Senior executives used to have time to formulate strategies and devise operating plans and then cascade them down through the organization. They used to make decisions that had some input from data and executives used to explore and take time to understand new technology, the political environment, the environment in general, and other issues. And when necessary, they would bring in big consulting firms to advise and guide them. But as change accelerated, planning cycles were greatly shortened, rendering plans obsolete by the time they were ready to launch. The old ways are no more, and Jeff stands by this. To believe they are valid means they are stuck in the past. Executives must now create a future fit culture where sense making, decision making, and action taking are tightly aligned and integrated. And to achieve this, the organization's own people must do the heavy lifting. It's their only path to success. Jeff's clients typically need to significantly reduce time to market. And that requires that their people break down internal barriers to cooperation and collaboration without the traditional silos. Jeff was involved in the organizational learning movement with Peter Senge and was on the global leadership team of the Society for Organizational Learning. Jeff, that's quite a resume. Welcome to Straight Talk About Business, and I look forward to your frank comments on the topic today. Well, thank you for the introduction, Regisa. I'm looking forward to it myself. Thank you for being here. Okay, let's get started right out the gate. Businesses now, post-pandemic, if it is actually post-pandemic, are in a state of chaos, and that is starting to highlight the inadequacies of strategic planning. So let's define the context for what you do a lot of work in, something called sense-making. Instead, let's talk about sense-making instead of strategy as a primary focus. The term sense-making may seem obvious, but what does it really mean to business of any size? Hmm. Yeah, well, it's a great question. And I mean, the way I would frame it is I would say that um, strategy was sense making it was making sense of the context in which we're operating making sense of what we can do as an organization making sense of how we can create value how we can provide interesting work for the people who work here so it's always been about making sense but as you said in the introduction when the world was moving much more slowly you could do that on an annual cycle i mean there used to be a time when you could do it on a five-year cycle so you would look at your organization, you would look at the market, you might get some strategy consulting firm to help you do that. They would look at the externals, they would talk to people in the body of the organization. And, and this is key, because talking to people in the body of the organization is where they tap into the best sense making in the organization. It's, it's where people are making sense of what customers want, because they're in touch with customers. They're making sense of the value creation the organization's doing. Uh, and whether it's doing well, doing it well or doing it badly. They're also making sense in, in quite diverse ways because increasingly these days, you've got multiple generations of people with different outlooks in the organization, you know, whether it's uh, fewer boomers these days, but Gen X, Gen Y, uh, Gen Z, millennials, you know, all of these different um, cohorts that we hear about. So, the, the, the issue with sense making now is that because of the fact that the world is changing so quickly and so unpredictably, and let's face it, any, any organization that had a strategy coming into 2020 
really didn't have one by about April 2020 when the pandemic landed because nobody could travel and nobody could do all of the things that everyone assumed that you could just do. I mean, even having meetings. And so we all went online and all of that. But, but the issue is that what typically has happened for a long time in organizations is people at the top have made decisions. People at the top see themselves. They see their job as decision-making. In fact, often we assume senior executive and decision maker are, are just interchangeable synonyms. And that actually reflects the historical past when the world is moving slowly and they could devote their time to making decisions that they then rolled out and fed down into the body of the organization. But you talk to anyone in an organization at a mid-level or below mid-level and you say to them, what tends to happen when a decision is made at the top that is then communicated into the body of the organization but it doesn't make sense because the people in the body of the organization are having to deal with the reality of customers, of the organization, of the outside world, of suppliers, et cetera. And they go, um, that doesn't make sense. So what do we do about it? Well, you've got three options. You either do what you're told to do, even though it doesn't make sense, because then you won't get into trouble, but then you don't have much motivation and you don't have much meaning in your work. So we have very high levels of disengagement because people are asked to do things that don't make sense to them. Secondly, you can go and say, well, look, this doesn't make sense, boss. Tell, you know, let me talk it through with you. And the boss says, um, we've already made that decision. You know, I've got 100,000 other decisions to make. Why? Because they're the decision makers, so all the decisions end up with them. Or thirdly, people go, well, that doesn't make sense. And I'm going to go and talk to my mates and my friends and my colleagues, the ones I trust, and say, look, this doesn't make sense, but what does make sense? And you make something up between you then you go and do that in the world. The organization creates value. The organization is successful because somebody has made up to do something other than what they were told to do because what they were told to do didn't make sense. But the other thing they have to do is make sure it never gets back to people at the top that what they did wasn't what they were told to do because otherwise they get into trouble. So you end up with this situation where people in senior positions don't know what's actually happening in the body of the organization because people are making things up that are different from what they're told to because what they're told to doesn't make sense. The organization is successful and the people at the top think it's successful because of the decisions they made. Whereas actually it's successful because people in the body of the organization corrected those decisions. So you never get the learning. And this is why the whole learning organization thing 30 years ago was A, so important and B, why it eventually failed was because this embedding of senior people seeing their job as decision makers prevented the sense making that's actually already going on in the body of their organization from being fully coupled up with the decision making and the action taking. So you've got this disconnect that's embedded in organizations and you can trace it all the way back to senior executives think their job is to make the decisions. What they should be thinking is their job is to create the conditions in which sense-making, decision-making, and action-taking are tightly coupled, rapidly and repeatedly iterated, deeply embedded and widely distributed throughout the organization. That is absolutely a great um, summary of, of what it all is. And, and you know, Jeff, as, as I'm listening to you, um, what, what comes to mind is some of the experiences I've had with, with these organizations. And that is that they're lacking know-how, you know, it's, it's, there's a way to go about how to make things make sense mm -hmm. in, in an organization. And, and I think this is something in uh, one article that I really enjoyed, the boats in Boston Harbor, mm -hmm. you refer to this as procedural knowing. And, um, you know, you also talk about um, people don't have meaning in their work anymore. And yet, you know, there are a lot of mature people in the workforce today that want to share their know-how, that actually have a very modern perspective. Um, do you think that if we have more sharing of the know-how, more sharing of that procedural knowing that you refer to um, in the workforce, do you think it'll give people more meaning especially in the context of the work, as you, as you were discussing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it would. Uh, I think we need to understand, you know, first of all, what is procedural knowledge as opposed to propositional knowledge, which is the usual knowledge that we overemphasize 
um, in you know ideas around cognition. And I mean, there's a debate been going on for 30 years uh, with cognitive philosophers about what is cognition. And there's a lot of bias towards the idea that cognition is having valid propositions that you can prove in a logical argument. And yet, you know, as you mentioned, procedural knowing is, is knowing how to do something like, you know, how to ride a bicycle, how to, how to conduct a podcast interview. You know, these are things that you learn about by doing them. You may have some propositional knowledge that tells you, you know, start off by introducing the speaker, then have a set of questions that you want to explore the topic and blah, blah, blah. But until you've actually done a few of them, you don't develop any muscles. And I, I quite like this analogy of, of muscle making. This is why I refer to future fitness in organizations, because it is about building muscles, new muscles. And you don't build muscles unless you do heavy lifting. And that's why I would say that a, big, a lot of the problems that we face in organizations are because when senior executives recognize there's a need to change, they bring in consultants, a big consultancy firm. And what they do is they ship in lots of their junior consultants to do the heavy lifting. Well, if any muscles do get developed in that process, they get developed in the consultants, not in the people in the organization. So in, in terms of your question specifically around the know-how that more mature people or people who've been around the park a few times uh, have and could share. It's useful to think about this in terms of the way crafts were taught and probably still are taught like pottery or uh, bricklaying or you know any, any skill that requires or any, any uh, practice or any um, employment or, or, or any industry that requires skill. Uh, and skill is the product of procedural knowledge. You practice, you do something, you try doing it, you get better at it, you build skills. You don't just build more information, you don't, you don't build more semantic knowledge. Um, and so the way that was traditionally taught was apprenticeship. So an apprentice would work alongside a master and the apprentice would see what the master did and try to emulate them, try to copy what they did, but they don't end up copying them exactly. They end up copying them enough to try it themselves to get to learn how to do it. So, you know, if, if you look at, say, a, a, a guitarist in a rock band, they'll often have learned by listening to rock music and maybe these days watching videos of other rock musicians. And they might say, actually, I quite like that thing that Brian May does when he's doing that particular riff. And I quite like this bit that, that Angus Young does, ACDC, if you're not into them. Um, you know, and, and so what they do is they try stuff out and they develop their own skill as a consequence of working alongside and being influenced by people who've got a greater degree of mastery. So this is really the only way in which procedural knowledge gets, gets shared and transferred. It's by working alongside others who've got more skill and see a big part of their role is coaching, developing, bringing along more junior people. And, you know, in an ideal world, that's what you get from senior executives. I'm very careful about my language here. You know, I don't tend to say leaders and leadership because I'm a great believer in Peter Senge's definition of leadership as the capacity of a human community to shape its future. And traditionally that capacity has been, has been um, certainly hasn't been maximized. It's been limited by people at the top mistakenly believing their job is to make decisions as opposed to create the conditions where that capacity to shape the future is maximized within the organization. And, and one big part of that is this kind of apprenticeship, learning by doing, learning alongside someone who says, well, you know, try this and okay, that didn't quite work. Well, you know, how about this? And gradually, gradually people develop new skills that way. Yeah. It could be supported of course by technology, but technology is no substitute for this. No. So my knowledge no. management didn't work. You know, knowledge management was supposed to capture, you know, 30 years ago, we're supposed to capture the knowledge of the organization, put it in an IT system. So it was kept within the organization when all the people retired. But of course, a huge amount of, of knowledge is procedural. And so that's embodied within people. It's tacit. It can't be made explicit. So this is the big challenge that organizations have. Yeah. So do you, um, again, this is purely from, from your perspective, when people get this sort of experience where they're learning the know-how alongside someone that's you know a master, as you say, do you think that once that knowledge and experience is acquired, will they feel that they have a greater meaning in their work? Yeah, I mean, I think meaning is an interesting word. I think it probably relates to um, motivation and well-being 
um, a big part of all of that, you know, in, in that whole Venn diagram of meaning, well-being and, and motivation um, is this idea of self-determination. And I, again, I'm a great fan of self-determination theory, which basically says that there are three things that human beings need in order to have this sense of meaning, well-being, motivation. And it's they need a degree of autonomy, which means they have choice about what they do and what they're spending their time doing. They have um, competence. That means that they're able to do something. They have some skills that allow them to produce things of value. And they experience relatedness. So they feel connected with other people in a meaningful way within, these, within an organization. So these three things, autonomy, competence, relatedness, a lot of people have heard about them sort of in a kind of... Um, adjacent or should I say I was going to say tangential but maybe I'll be kind and say adjacent way from the work of Dan Pink and his book Drive where he talks about autonomy mastery and purpose and and to me I'd rather go back to Ryan and DC's original formulation of this which is autonomy competence relatedness because okay you could argue yeah, okay they both use autonomy you could argue that competence and mastery are pretty close things and you know we could debate that but they are pretty close the key difference is Whereas Ryan and DC said relatedness was the third component, Dan Pink turned that into purpose. And I think that's a particularly US kind of mindset around it, very individualistic. It's kind of like as an individual, what gives you motivation is your sense of autonomy, mastery and purpose. But as an organization, you know, organizations need knowledge that is extended, uses extended intelligence between different people. It's the collective intelligence of people that allows organizations to survive and thrive in this complex world of, of unpredictable and uh, unpredictability and uncertainty. Um, and so I think it's really important, this idea of relatedness. Without relatedness, meaning, the meaning that people experience in that work is vastly reduced. Mm. Okay, um, so I, I'd like to just make a little shift now, um, still focusing, of course, on the business environment. But what I'm observing, and I'd love to hear your views on this, is that in, in the business environment, there's a lot of talk on beliefs and values and purpose and objectives and, and so on. And as well, you know, there's, there's many theories on how to create change and, and, you know, continual improvement and things like that. My view is that we need to be looking at business through more of an adaptability perspective. You know, there's only so much you can improve and there's only so much that is continuous improvement. What are your thoughts on how easily people can just simply adapt and, and align to a new context in the workplace environment, you know, which now, post-pandemic, it's all a new context. What are your thoughts on, on adapting as opposed to just change and continual improvement? Well, it, it, great question. And I mean, until you got to the bit that said in the business environment or in the organizational environment, I was gonna say people are really good at adapting all the time. You know, we do it all of the time except in the organizational environment, right? So what's the difference? You know, what is the difference between doing stuff where you decide, you know, I'm gonna try this new sport out, or I'm gonna to go to this new restaurant, or I'm gonna go and do this new thing, or, or, or try a different type of music, or, you know, we're adapting all the time to changing opportunities and, and changing interests. Uh, so what is it about the organizational environment that stops that from happening? And I think it is this kind of embedded idea the, the more senior somebody is, the more they call the shots, the more they tell other people what to do. This is the fundamental thing that I think constrains organizations from moving forward. Um, and as a consequence of that, they see their job is to plan everything out. Uh, and I mean, a few couple of years ago, that's three years ago now, 2019, I wrote this um, 20 page paper called The Five Fatal Habits. Uh, and it was about why don't organizations adapt? Why do they not have the adaptability, the innovation and the agility that they need to survive in an increasingly uncertain and unpredictable world? And so the five habits were, you know, uh, one best way thinking. It's kind of like, you know, there is one best way to do it. We need to go and find out what it is. He spent ages thinking about the one, one best way. 
And the next fatal habit is uh, all or nothing thinking. It's like you have to plan out the whole of a transformation of your organization, soup to nuts. You can't just sort of iterate and, and allow things to evolve. So you have to do all of that up front. Um, the third one was um, leadership that creates followers. So instead of leadership being the capacity of the community, you have senior people who say, well, you know, this is like the John Cotter eight step change process where senior people form a guiding coalition and come up with a vision and they get people to follow the vision and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Because all the visioning and all the inspiration is done by those people at the top doesn't really allow people in the body of the organization to experience autonomy, competence, and relatedness. They're told what to do. Um, the fourth one is wasting people's strengths, where organizations try and make people fit into job specifications. I mean, it's like people are cogs in machines, and therefore they have to fit the specification of the cog rather than, I mean, Peter Drucker was talking about this you know, 50, 60 years ago, the need for organizations to, to meld and to form themselves around the people that they have, not try and force people to fit into specific roles. And yet we still have HR systems that do all of that. Mm -hmm. And the fifth fatal habit is hired help that hinders, which is you bring in a big consulting firm and they're, they're hired help to try and help you move forward. But because their people do the heavy lifting, your people don't develop any new muscles. And what do they do is they reinforce the other four fatal habits because they want to be doing a one best way. That's why they say they've got best practice. They want it to be soup to nuts because that sells the largest consulting assignment. They want the leadership to stay in positions where they have followers because then they're going to need the consultants because they're not relying on their own people. And they're quite happy to have people who fit into specific roles because the consultants have designed those roles. So we're kind of locked into this situation where when organizations eventually realize, oh my God, we need to change, first thing they do is pick up the phone and ring up the consulting firm who come in and do more things that inhibit the capacity of the organization to actually be able to change. And then we say, well, why don't we have any agile adaptive organizations? We had so-and-so in to do their world-class best practice adaptive culture project, but yeah, how do they deliver it with their consultants coming in doing all the heavy lifting? You didn't develop any new muscles. It's like, you know, you, you decide I need to get fit. Um, so I'm going to hire somebody to go down the gym and lift weights for me. And three months later, you've paid them a few thousand bucks, but your muscles haven't got any better. And you know, there's something wrong with this. What's going on? Why haven't I developed any muscles? I mean, I hired one of the best weightlifting firms to go and lift all the weights for me. You know, it's like, I mean, it sounds stupid, doesn't it? But it's what organizations do. It, and they continue to do. And, mm. and will probably continue to do for, for a long while. And, you know, change will continue to happen. People will get tired of it. And, and yet it seems to me like we've, we've gone full cycle. You know, a, a lot of the things that you're talking about is something I remember back from, from the 80s, you know, and none of this has, has really changed very much. What I think has um, Introduce, been introduced in, into the workplace, but not just the workplace. Many, many individuals are seeking all kinds of new learning all the time. You know, you look at online courses, you look at, um, you know, different places that people can go to learn. And they're learning, 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 and, and they're full of knowledge. When is enough learning enough? you know, at some point in time, they're going to have to apply this type of learning. What are, you, what are your thoughts on when is there enough learning? When does learning give you meaning? When do you apply it? You know, you, you write a lot on, um, and, and I, I, love, I love your writing because it's all about innovation, agility, and adaptiveness. And you say that it only emerges when learning is alive in an organization or an individual, right? But when is it enough? Is there ever enough? What do you think? Yeah, I think, I think here it becomes very important to go back to something I said very, very early on in the call, which is the, um, the types of knowledge. You know, we do have a heavy bias towards propositional knowledge. So we go on a course and we learn so-and-so told us this and, you know, we go on a philosophy course and we learn what Wittgenstein said and we learn what Kant said and we learn what Nietzsche said. And the, but do we actually embody that? Do we actually bring that into procedural knowing? Do we put it into practice? 
in our actual actions and interactions, because I would argue that it's not so much that we ever stop learning. I mean, ideally, we're always learning. But the question is, are we just learning more information that we can trot out at a dinner party to impress our friends? Or are we actually learning how to do something that we didn't know how to do before? And that, that, that's, and that type of learning to, to do something we didn't know how to do before has a certain sort of scariness to it because you can't just read lots of stuff and sound impressive. You actually have to try it out. And when you start trying it out, you're not very good. Now, it's like a little baby learning to walk. Um, I have a 30 year meditation practice. And when I started, I was absolutely useless. And I kept asking people, how do you do it? And they said, you just have to do it. And I'm like, yeah, but how? And I spent ages trying to work out what's the, what's the best way, you know, back to my one best way, right? What's the best way of doing it? The best way to do it is to, it's like a baby learning to walk. The best way to learn to walk is not to wait until you've got a PhD in anatomy and tendons and muscle structure and, and you know, where the femur is compared to the whatever, the metatarsal. It's actually to get up and try walking. And after a little while, you stop falling over so much. So you get better and better and better at it. But we don't like that as adults. As adults, as smart, clever people, we like, I'd like to just do a course and I'd be brilliant at it. But anything procedural requires being incompetent at it, gradually getting better and better as we embody the practice. Um, and, you know, the procedural is only the second kind of, if, 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 the, if the propositional knowing of information of facts is the most superficial form of learning, pro, um, procedural is only the next level down. Then there's, then there's perspectival knowing. It's like, what is my personal perspective on something? How, how, what's, what's the... Um, how do things appear to me from the perspective that I adopt? And then at, a, at the deepest level, it's this participatory knowing where myself, as I see the world and the world as it presents to me, are co-created by my attention, what, what I pay attention to. I mean, a couple of people that I think are fabulous in this, uh, one's a Canadian, Professor John Viveki at the University of Toronto. Uh, and another one is a, a, a Scottish, um, I, I guess you'd call him a professor, but. He was a neuroscientist and a psychiatrist, worked at Johns Hopkins, worked at the Maudsley in London, um, Dr. Ian, Ian McGilchrist. And he's really put huge amounts of um, research over the last 30 years into understanding the different ways the left and right hemispheres of the brain work with knowledge and with learning and why we've ended up really getting locked into an, over, over, an overly um, dominant focus on propositional knowledge, being able to give the right answer. We teach it in schools. It's like, you know, what's the right answer? And you come up with a different answer and you're told that you're wrong. And yet it's the people who don't come up with the standard answer who are the ones who do all the innovation. It's also these deeper levels of knowing that actually create meaning. You know, the more we feel that we've got this sort of procedural learning going on, we're developing new skills and capabilities. We, we're getting greater, greater mastery, uh, greater competence the more we feel that we bring a valid perspective and the more we feel we're participating in creating the future of the organization, then the more meaning we will have. This, this conversation um, wants me to go down a path of systems thinking as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but that's, that's not our topic today, but maybe I'll get you back on that one another time. Um, Jeff, this has been a fabulous conversation. I am a big fan of, of your writing. And where would you like to tell our listeners to find what you publish? So um, you can find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the easiest place to find me. There probably is more than one Jeff Marlowe, spelt with uh, the English spelling, um, G-E-O-F-F. You can probably see it on the recording here. Um, Dragisi will probably put some links, I guess, in the show notes yeah. under the recording of this. Um, but the writing that you mentioned is on my Substack channel, which you can get to from my website. And my website is just jeffmarlow.com. So if you went there and looked at the resources page, there's some videos. There's actually a link to the Five Fatal Habits document I mentioned. And um, there's also a link to my Substack channel where I do my weekly posts. So, Perfect. Jeff, I thank you for your insights, your knowledge, sharing. Um, this is really great. And I hope we have an opportunity to come together again mm. and 
um, I'd like to, to discuss some more of your articles because you, you are consistent, if nothing else, in, in your message and uh, extremely well, extremely well thought through. Um, Thank you. You know, uh, great on you. I, I just love reading your work. Thank you. Okay.